This is the Wealth Ability for CPAs show. Better clients, better practice, better life. Here's Tom Wheelwright. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show for CPAs, where we're always discovering how to build better clients, a better practice, and a better life. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of the Wealth Ability Network. So most CPA firms are small and they're super small. They're one person to 10 people. And given that, but they also want to grow. So how does a small and sometimes even a sole proprietor, how do they all of a sudden grow to be big? Because not very many do. So what is that secret? And we have the expert on making small, really profitable businesses grow. And that is Elaine Pofelt. And I get your, I, did I say that right, Elaine? You did get it right. And Perfect. you didn't even ask me how to pronounce it. That was wonderful. <laughs> Elaine Pofelt, her book is Tiny Business, Big Money. And I love this. Elaine, uh, welcome to the Wealth Ability Show for CPAs. And if you would, give us a little of your background. Why, what got you into this very, the kind of the micro business area? Oh, sure, Tom. And thank you so much. It's so great to be here with your audience of 45,000 CPA firms. This is just super exciting for me. I got interested in the micro business because I started one myself, like a lot of the CPAs that probably put out a shingle. I was a journalist who put out a shingle. I had worked wow. in corporate for quite a while. And um, I was really interested in maximizing my own revenue. And when I came across census data showing that there were solopreneurs getting to 1 million in revenue, I got very curious and it became a focus of my writing. That's, um, that's great. I mean, a million dollars with a solopreneur is uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So, um, so what's, let's just start right out. Step one, when you're, when you're a solopreneur, let's say you're making 200, 200 to $500,000 as a solopreneur, that would probably be pretty typical. Um, what is it? What What are some of the things you have to do when you're targeting that bigger number? The key is efficiency. So the first thing that I see entrepreneurs doing is automating as much as they can. And that's good for accountants because there is a lot going on with AI and automation. There are a lot of things like routine tax notices that go out, things that a human being doesn't really need to touch and that don't really impact client service, but they need to get done. So staying up on the automation that's coming out for your field is really important. Now, I know a lot of people are, are not technophiles. But you can usually hire someone, including your own teenage children, to help you with this. <laughs> if you have sure. a very small business, I hired my teenagers in my business. And that's a good way to stay up on these things and continually upgrading them too. It is an investment, but when you think about it, your time is worth a lot of money too. So there's that. There's also the use of contractors. A lot of times you, if you're using accounting help, you probably need to put the people on payroll because knowing the hours in the accounting profession, they're going to be employees, but you could use a contractor to do your social media marketing, which you should be doing sure. if you want to grow. You you can use contractors for a lot of the other types of work in your business that are not your core strength. Even if you're good at them, maybe there's someone else who's better. And that's another way to free up your time for the high value work in your business that allows your business to really take off. Visibility is very important. I know a lot of accountants like to be behind the scenes, being the advisor who guides the client who's out front, but you do need to be visible. You do need to be out there speaking, doing podcasts, things like that. So people know about you because that builds your personal brand as an accountant. And you can do it through value. You don't have to be grandstanding about yourself or your life story. It could just be that you're sharing valuable knowledge. So let's back up a little bit and break those down because those are all, frankly, this is a path I've already taken. And so I, I started by myself. I had two clients. I actually beat the streets and uh, doubled my business in nine months. So I had four, um, which yes. wasn't enough to That's feed great. my family, not quite enough to feed my family. But, um, and I remember um, that first employee. So the first employee you hire is doubling the number of employees in your business, right? So that's a big step, that first employee. So what are some of the things that you have to consider when you're thinking about, do I, because I think a lot of solopreneurs, they go, I don't want an employee. 
I really don't want that. And they try to do it with contractors, but like you say, it's tough to do it solely with contractors. And so they go, okay, so how do I kind of make that step to that first employee? One thing that I learned from a lot of the entrepreneurs in both of my books is documenting your processes. You know what good looks like in your head. You know, what is a good tax return or a good strategic planning report? What does that look like? So that you have a good example to share with your team and then documenting every step it takes to get there is really important too. So if you hand it off to someone and then you, you do a download from your brain and then they go back to their office and forget how to do it, they can look back at that before they come back into your office and ask you for help again. That can save a lot of time. You do have to make a little bit of an investment in training people, whether it's a contractor or an employee to free up your time, but it's also important to make sure that you're hiring A players. This is one thing that I think people make a mistake on. They feel like they can't make payroll, so they should hire the lowest paid person, but then the training is so steep, and sometimes the person just doesn't have the right stuff to do the job. So I've always found you're better off hiring someone who's really good at what they do, even if they cost more. And this isn't a function of age or years in the business. You can tell if you're in a field, like I can look at a journalist's work and know if it's good or not. Same thing with everyone who's listening to this. You can look at an accountant's work and know if they know what they're doing. They could be 22, they could be 62. It doesn't matter, but you you probably are going to have to pay for the good people, but it's going to save you so much money to have a better person that it's worth it in most cases. Yeah, I've, I've totally found that. Um, and, and you're right. You can tell. I mean, you, you can tell how smart somebody is in a quick conversation. You can tell, are they going to catch on in a quick conversation? And, you know, I love the old adage, you know, hire slow and fire fast. Um, because you do want to make sure that you've got those A players and every once in a while you do make a mistake. And, you know, some people, like you say, they're CPA. Sometimes we say CPA stands for cheapest people in America. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that one. That's very funny. Uh, so we, we, we tend to under hire because of that, because we're worried about the cost. But the other side of that is the typical billing structure is we're going to bill them three to four times as much as we pay them. So if we're doing that, why wouldn't you hire, you know, hire the best and then you can a charge more, they can do more. Um, you get a better person, you have less oversight that you need to do and they can actually contribute back to you instead of you having to constantly show them how to do. So I, I love that piece of advice that you don't want to under hire you and, and you mentioned upgrading. So talk a little bit about upgrading because I think that's so important. Oh, absolutely. Well, if if you don't have A players, then one way to find them is to use contractors, maybe use them on a small finite project. Like if you're looking to bring on someone who can do strategic planning with your clients, have them do one strategic planning report and see how are their soft skills? How is their turnaround? How is their overall vibe with regard to your firm? Because one of the things I talked about in Tiny Business Big Money is you could be a firm with two people. It still has a culture. Mm -hmm. And they have there has to be a culture fit with your business. You you want a diversity of opinions and ideas, but at the same time, you do need to be simpatico with how each other works or else you'll both be very unhappy. And also with what is good client service, what is the demeanor you present to clients? Some firms are very casual, some are very buttoned up, and it probably depends on the industries that you serve. But with regard to upgrading, another thing that I noticed is the entrepreneurs in, in both the million dollar one person business and tiny business, big money, which talks about businesses with small teams, upgrade their clients too. Yes, This is true whether they're solos or, or running a traditional small business, because some clients are just your ideal clients. They're, they're on the same page with you in terms of what good looks like. They pay you an adequate amount so that you can devote the proper amount of time to serving them. There's a lot of good give and take between you so that one plus one doesn't make two, it makes three because your brains are collaborating at such a high level. I mean, that's kind of what will grow your business because those types of relationships tend to blossom and you only wind up doing more and more with them. 
I, I will tell you that my favorite clients over the years, and I've been in this business over 40 years, my favorite clients have always been those who push me. And they're going to say, well, wait a minute. What about this? And it's, you know, it's not that, because you don't have the all the answers. I mean, I'll have all the answers. I've been doing this 40 years. I, I'll, I don't, I'll never have all the answers. But the clients can push. And it doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're bending and you're you're bending the rules or anything like that. You don't have to do that. But they can push your mind and they can push you to to new levels, I think. So I think that's very good. But let's talk about that. You talk, you talk about um, the niche and actually being very specific on your clients and not trying to do everything for everybody. So tell us, I, I call that branding because that's really your brand. Your brand includes who are your clients? Who are you trying to attract as clients? So can you talk about that when it comes to a single person firm? Oh, absolutely. I think that's very important because let's say you were in e-commerce. You can't be Jeff Bezos if you're a one-person business. The same applies to accounting. You really can't compete with the biggest accounting firms in the world in every area because you just don't have the time to do it. You don't have the person power to do it, but you can be the best in a niche area. And there are many opportunities to productize your knowledge if you are the best in that area. I'll give you an example. Um, this was actually from law, but it could just as easily have been in accounting. I was writing an article for creditcards.com about a very obscure change in credit card law that was important for people to know about. And there was this law firm in Washington, D.C., that had two lawyers who were the leading experts on this nuance of the law. And credit card law is, if you've ever looked at it, it's you have to go through reams and reams of paper to find anything. It's imagine. just a nightmare. So they were charging, I had to pay almost $300 to go to this webinar. There were 600 people on the call with these two guys. It was one hour. There was a short Q&A at the end and they were airing it three times. So think about that in terms of profit. They could have tried to sit down with that many clients, but that would have taken them all year. It would not have been nearly as profitable as maybe they put 10 hours into prep time. They hired a webinar company. So there was some in investment in it, but it was something people needed to know. This wasn't Gary V. It wasn't the most entertaining thing in the world. So they didn't have to be show people doing it. They just had to share the information about this law. And I would gather that everybody who's listening to this program has some niche like this where they probably know more than anybody in America about it in accounting just because of the clients they serve. I remember I found one accountant who served only people that were doing things like Uber and he was the leading expert in accounting for people who are Uber drivers. Yeah. You could I, be that. I have, a, I, have a, I have a buddy who's, uh, whose niche is Bitcoin. He's his, but, his CPA but, firm. All they do is cryptocurrency. That is, their, that is their niche as a CPA firm. It's cryptocurrency. That's fantastic. So then once you have that niche and you're out there cultivating clients, you have this clinical knowledge, like a doctor who's practicing in the clinic um, of what's on people's minds. What do they need to know? What don't they know? What do you keep telling them over and over, but they're not understanding? These are all opportunities to educate people. So then you can get into things like do you offer a coaching program? Do you offer a mastermind for people that would like to learn, but also do it in a group where they can network with other like-minded business people? Do you develop a course? There's one copywriter that I wrote about, Laura Belgray, who created a PDF document. She worked with a designer. It was about how to write the About Us page on a website. Now, she's a very funny copywriter. So this was going to be the best course on the About Us page in, in the world, probably. But you could do this in accounting too. You could hire a copywriter to write it for you and you create a PDF course. And she got to a million, but she was at about 250,000. If I remember correctly, she worked with a business coach who said, you're not promoting these courses enough. Send out your email newsletter three times a week and promote them. And that's in combination with a mastermind about copywriting is what catapulted her to 1 million. So that thinking doesn't really just apply to copywriting. Any professional services firm that has expertise can package their expertise in that way and tailor it to their personalities. In her case, she gets tired from doing too much public speaking. So she does one live course in the mastermind. Another one is a recorded one. 
Some people are introverts, some people are extroverts, but the beauty of these micro businesses is there's no one saying you have to be a certain personality or a certain way. You just need to have a skill you can sell. Well, and, and think about that. What if you only did those things that you love to do? I mean, that to me, that's pretty much nirvana anyway. And that's why we always say our, our mantra is better clients, better practice, better life. Because um, what happens is you get niched in your clients. Okay, this is what we do, right? So you'll see my books behind me, Win-Win Wealth Strategy and Tax-Free Wealth. We do one thing. We talk about taxes as incentives. And that's what we do. And we're, we're the authorities on that. And, um, and it's absolutely has that huge impact because you're going to attract the people you want to attract. You're not going to attract other people. So, but if you, if you can, um, one more thing you brought up was getting the word out through education. And you, you gave the example of your copywriter who did it. it she was educating, right? She was actually selling education. Um, but then you talk about doing podcasts that's giving away education. So when you look at education as a marketing method, social media, whether it's social media, webinar, whatever, um, how, how do you place that in level of importance with that solopreneur in getting their message out? I think it's very important, but you do have to be mindful of your time. If you're out there constantly public speaking and you're not getting paid for it, then you're not doing the accounting work in the business. So there's a balancing act between the two things. And for some people, they're such good speakers or such good promoters on LinkedIn that every hour they put into that will bring in 10 clients. Other people, maybe they don't get as many leads from that and they really are better off serving the clients that they have really well so that organically those clients come to them and say, hey, wow, you did a great job on my taxes this year. Do you offer any services in this area? Could we go a little deeper with this? Could you be an outsource CFO? You have to know yourself and know how good you are. Everybody can improve in these areas, but you have a natural level that you're at right now and you've got to balance marketing with the work of the business. This is because the business is so small in terms of number of people, but you can also outsource some things. You could say, well, the one thing I am going to outsource is my social media because if I'm on LinkedIn every day posting an informative post about accounting, something that my target clients need to know, that can really help you. I know in um, my own case, I had about 5,000 LinkedIn followers two years ago and I found myself because I wrote the books posting about entrepreneurship every day, pretty much one time every day. And I would limit myself to 10 minutes and it would always be about small business, entrepreneurship, solopreneur. And I'd always tag them a certain way. And then my following went up to like 58,000, I think currently wow. That's awesome. It really fast. It went to 10 and then it just multiplied and I didn't really know what I did, but then I thought back over what I was doing. And basically it was a combo. It was my own article, but in the case of accountants, maybe they may or may not be writing for accounting publications. So you'd want to share anything you're writing. I would share things by people that I respect in my field who are writing about entrepreneurship. Occasionally something else I was interested in, like I'm a health nut. So maybe something about healthy living here and there, just to give a little personality to it. Then any events I was involved with events, my friends in entrepreneurship were involved in. And then inquiries, like if I was looking for someone um, to help a client put up their Squarespace website, or I was looking for a source for a story, those things tend to get forwarded. That was a combination. I don't know if it's scientific, but I would say it was pretty easy. 10 minutes a day, I was producing this information anyway. And for an accountant, maybe you're, every day you're reading a few publications, you see something that your clients need to know about, or today is a tax deadline, or it's 10 days away from a tax deadline. Have you thought about this? Do you remember the deadline? Do you know about this change in federal law for this year? When you give away that information, that generosity pays itself back because you're giving people a little taste of your brain and how you think. And if they like what's coming out of your LinkedIn, and I say LinkedIn because I think that's really where most accountants need to be. The other ones, it depends. Like if you served, say you served Instagram influencers, then you want to be all over Instagram or health and wellness professionals or the types of businesses that tend to be on there. Otherwise, for most of the accountants, I'd say it's LinkedIn. 
then you could take it a step further. You could join some groups and share some things in there, or you could do LinkedIn lives. But I don't want to even suggest that as a first step because those have more of a learning curve. Just doing the basics will get you pretty far. I do get a lot of inquiries that way. And I think the same would be true for an accountant who's a niche player. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, I mean, as an example, so I'm I'm a baby boomer. So I didn't grow up with technology. So I don't pretend to understand technology um, as far as um, like even getting on Facebook, anything like that. But guess what? I can hire somebody and I can hire somebody who's 25 and they know everything you need to know about Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. And it's not very expensive. And so I, I find that um, the, the worst thing we can do is do it ourselves. And the best thing we can do is find somebody to do it for us so that we can pretty much do what is our highest and best use of our time, uh, as well as something that we really like doing. You know, if you like doing Instagram, great. But if you don't, why are you, know, why are you doing it? Let somebody else do it. Oh, absolutely. One thing about the platforms is I do think they try to have the maximum number of users. So they try to make them as intuitive as they can. But that said, there's a learning curve for every single one of them. And sometimes if I'm not familiar with things like my 16 year old daughter does TikTok a lot, I don't really go on TikTok. So if I were to do something on TikTok, I would just hire her to put right. it up. But she knows that platform really well. I don't think she knows LinkedIn that well. So you want to look to people you know that already use it. My, I hire my 12 year old son for some things with YouTube because he's a video gamer. He likes that. So you probably have people in your own family that are kids or teenagers who can use a few extra bucks and they're happy to do it. Or you can find someone through referrals. Um, and I think technology is one thing and this is a little this is almost like tech light so it can be intimidating but it's different than putting up your own website still that said you do want other people to do it for you if you if you you're the accountant you shouldn't be doing all your own social media no i i agree i'm i'm, I'm a big fan of letting everybody else do something that i don't really want to do or that i'm not good at and that's how we built a um you know, uh, that's how we build our company. That's how we built a network of CPAs. Let me finish with that if we can. Can you talk about how important it is to network with other professionals? I think it's vital. One of the most interesting things I've found is so many of the entrepreneurs in both of my books know each other. And the way I look at these million dollar one person businesses and tiny businesses that make big money is a lot of them are very ambitious introverts. They love being by themselves, they get a lot of energy from that. And yet they like people. They just don't like to be overwhelmed by people the way maybe you would be in a corporation. And so they do network. And I think the key with networking is finding the place that you're comfortable. And it really varies. Some people love going to trade shows or conferences, things like that, an educational event in your industry. Now everybody wants to get back out again. So it feels so good to be in a group of people and just, you know, mingling over a, a glass of wine or a cup of coffee or whatever. We just haven't done it for so long. Well, you could do it online. Absolutely. And it's actually one of the reasons we created the Wealth Ability Network. We actually have a network of CPAs and uh, accountants and we have, we have solopreneurs. So it, I, I love getting together with the network. I love what you're doing, Elaine. I think this, uh, I love the small um, businesses. I, I totally love this, the entrepreneurs, the solopreneurs. Again, the book is Tiny Business, Big Money, Strategies for Creating High Revenue Micro Business. Um, where would we go to get more information about you, Elaine? They um, can go to tinybusinessbigmoney.com or my name, elainepofeld.com, which is in the show notes, which you pronounce perfectly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank or you. LinkedIn. I, I love hearing from readers because I'm a journalist and it makes me a better journalist. If you heard something on here that you'd like to know more about, I'm happy to hear from you because that way it might be an avenue that I can look into and research for people and publish in an article that, that would serve people well. So please feel free to write. Um, this was great, Tom. Thank you for what you're doing because I do think podcasting is a great medium for people to educate themselves. It's so portable. People love to listen to things now like audible books and it's so great to listen to a useful podcast in your car when you're out on a walk. 
we can squeeze it in, unlike a regular book sometimes. <laughs> so thanks for what you do. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, remember, it is Tiny Business Big Money, ElainePofelt.com or TinyBusinessBigMoney.com. And uh, remember that when you do these things, I mean, it's not that hard to go to um, a, a million dollar business. It's I've done it multiple times. It's just not that hard. There are certain principles you follow. And I would pick up um, Elaine's uh, book for sure in a heartbeat. Pick it up, read it, use it. And when you do, you're going to end with better clients, better practice, and a better life. We'll see you all next time. You've been listening to the Wealth Ability for CPA show. Better clients, better practice, better life. To learn more, go to wealthability.com. 